Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Palazzolo, and uh, I'm going to do a presentation on the prehistory of TRSA graphics. And I put the dates 1973 to 1977 there. Um, let me just quickly talk a little bit about, about me. I, like many other of you in this room, probably learned how to program on a TRS-80. Surprise, surprise. Um, uh, I learned to program on a, on a Model 3 mostly, but uh, I, you know, anybody recognize this screenshot right here? This is, um, I walked into a Radio Shack probably in 1977 or 78, and uh, this is one of those programs you can type in from the manual, from the basic manual in the back of the room. Uh, in the back of the book, and I can show you right here real quick this silly little demo. You type run and it has you enter your initials. And uh, all it does is draw a silly picture of a, of a castle. And uh, it does it nice and slow, the way the TRS-80 pixel graphics used to work, still work. and. Uh, Personalized, put your name on the castle, and then it shoots a projectile and prints kapow. This is it. And, uh, but I remember this silly demo running on like, you know, this TV set in the corner of a Radio Shack, basically. And uh, I was kind of dazzled by the thing. Like, how can it do that? How does it remember your name? How does it draw things on the screen? And then somebody at the store actually told me, well, you know, if you want to see how it's done, uh, you can type list and the program is right there, you know? And I didn't know what I was looking at. I probably, as a kid, saw like these set and reset commands and I might have guessed if I was really on my game that, that you could turn on like dots on the screen somehow. And uh, I, was, I was intrigued and I think my life was forever changed. Um, so... I ended up with a career in as an electrical engineer and software developer, is still working today. And I started with retro computing and emulation as a hobby back in 1997. And uh, I'm still doing it. In fact, if you notice, I credited a friend of mine, Evan Allen, on the first slide for helping me with this. I've been getting together with him almost every Friday for about the last five years to uh, fix stuff and um, you know publish new tools, just all kinds of different things. And uh, I, I like it. It's my, it's my primary hobby. So what are we talking about here? Well, most people probably know this from this room. But the TRS-80, when it was released in 1977, had uh, 64 by 16 character graphics. Or if you wanted to, you could use the extra wide characters, which were only 32 by 16. And um, it used 1K of video memory. Uh, 1,024 characters, and these pixels that we're talking about were 128 by 48 pixels, which is just ridiculous by today's standards, but, um, you know, that's six per character cell, they're two by three character cells, and uh, crucially, you could do things with the pixels from BASIC, so from the simplest system with a cassette and BASIC, you could turn on and off these pixels and do things, and um, so this was my introduction to computer graphics. Um, and I guess five by eight, or technically five by seven fonts on the first uh, Model 1. So the question is, where did these characteristics come from? Because for me, showing up in a Radio Shack store in 1977, um, it was like it materialized out of nowhere. I'd never seen anything like it before. And, uh, and it was the first of many uh, computers that I would see in the next several years. Um, with similar or better capabilities, but that first one was, you know, where did it, where did it come from? It seemed to come from nowhere from, for me as a, as a child anyway. Um, so I want to go back, all the way back, to a gentleman named Don Lancaster, who uh, sadly just passed away this year. Uh, he was a very prolific author uh, and electronics designer. He wrote many articles for Popular Electronics um, over the years, published many books, uh, some of them might still actually be in print. That the, 
what these books were oriented towards were for people who wanted to play around with computer chips, this is the kind of stuff that you could do with them. And they were, they were half reference book on how to use the chips. And they were half idea books on, you know, oh, okay, how do we want to like put them together to build something interesting? And uh, as the technologies came out, different kinds of chips, TTL chips, later CMOS chips, he kept going. He had these cookbooks, as they were called, and they were oriented towards hobbyists and DIY folks. They weren't written in, uh, you know, some very high-level mathematical engineering speak. They were like, okay, you can buy these chips at Radio Shack or you know your nearby electronics store and these are the things you can do with them. Um, so at the time uh, he published a book called the TV Typewriter Cookbook because he had done an article for Popular Electronics where he built something called a TV Typewriter. Now that's, that's a pretty funny name to my ears in, in 2023, a TV Typewriter. What the heck is that? Um, and to some extent it's it wasn't even really that exciting when it first came out because it was a box with a keyboard that you can plug into a TV and you could type some text and it would show up on your TV. And that's it. It had, uh, let's go to the next slide here. Yeah, so this is a 1973 article. Uh, this is a prototype of the TV typewriter. This is, you can go see this in uh, Mountain View, California in the Computer History Museum. Uh, you know, he got some of these switches. You know, you can see that they're not the kind of switches we'd normally have on a keyboard. This was whatever you could source uh, for cheap. Um, the design was in the Popular Electronics magazine. Uh, later, he published the cookbook because, um, you know, maybe you want to do more than just put text on the screen. So the cookbook had a lot more extended ideas. But um, the TV typewriter in its first incarnation was 32 by 16 characters. Um, it had 1K of memory, but it had two pages, so you could switch back and forth between two different pages. Um, it had a 5x7 font. It used this uh, Signetics 2513 character generator IC for the font, only 64 characters. Um, it ended up being the same chip that was used in the, the Apple One. Um, so, uh, yeah, what else? Uh, yeah, built from standard parts, interfaces to a TV. One of the reasons why it was only 32 characters across is because when you connect things up to a, uh, a plain standard old uh, TV, it has a limited bandwidth. And so the, if you try to put a signal, a higher speed signal with finer details, at some point it just gets blurrier. And really 64 is on the border of being unreadable. So, you know, he stopped at 32. Um, and if you look at the design carefully, you'll see that the reason he's using 32 by 16 is because you can do that with sort of a minimal number of chips because everything is a power of two. It's just a convenience, a mathematical convenience. If you're going to build something, that's what you get, and it makes it easier to easy to design and easy to build for somebody. So, um, I, you'll see on a few slides these timings numbers. I didn't want to get into too many details because I kind of I took a deep dive on this thing and looked at okay, based on this circuit, it's 15,840 lines per second and 60 frames per second and 264 scan lines per screen. But I wanted to do that kind of technical comparison between designs. And so I kind of came up with this little shorthand just for me to look at and say, okay, that's, that's what that configuration is. Um, the only thing in particular that's special about the 264 is that a normal TV screen uses what they call an interlaced signal, which means you get sort of, uh, you know, some scan lines on one screen and then on the next screen, you get scan lines in between the other scan lines, and then it repeats. So you don't see a gap. You don't really see a black line on a television when you're receiving a television broadcast. But for all of the th systems that we'll see, they use a non-interlaced display, which means um, every frame, 60 frames per second, were the same. And as a side effect, you got the classic, some people would call them classic, black uh, spaces in between the scan lines, which everybody associates with a computer display from that era. Um, so 264 whole number, and that's where that comes from. Um, so being a programmer and doing some research for this, I, uh, I wrote some Python code to render things based on, uh, okay, somebody out there has a ROM dump. Actually, I made another one from a real 2513 chip because I'm trying to be pedantic and archive all this stuff properly. Um, 
take a, take a look at those ROM images, try to render them in the right aspect ratio with the scan lines. You can see there's a picture up at the top there, that little grid. And uh, the grid is trying to tell you that you have um, the character font that gets generated is five by, five by seven. It's actually eight by seven, but the top one is always empty in this chip. And uh, then that gives you, uh, for the TV typewriter design, they decided to take the five by eight font and put each one into a six by 12 character spot. That gives you the gap you see between the characters, either uh, horizontally or vertically. So I just made a little, little uh, icon up there to kind of keep track of these things. And uh, you'll see it's 32 across and 16 down. Uh, to my eye, it's already looking a little more TRS-80 like than I expected. So, um, so we fast forward not very far from 1973 to the very end of 1974. Um, Popular Electronics had published the article for the TV typewriter and they, they, the editors of Popular Electronics were always looking for the next thing that was gonna, you know, that they could put in the magazine. So, um, and Ed Roberts and Bill Yates from uh, the company MITS uh, made the Altair, the Altair 8800, which was um, you know, a kit computer. You could buy it as a kit or you could buy it fully built. And uh, if you look at it, it ran on an 8080. It had front panel switches and lights. There's no screen, there's no keyboard, there's no mass storage. Um, later, the, you would, well, what you found out though is that it used a bus architecture internally. And that bus architecture was initially called the Altair bus, but people jumped on that immediately and said, oh, this is a, this is a, a, a good bus architecture. We could make cards that would work in an Altair. We could make computers that had the same bus so that the cards would interchange. Um, and this started uh, the, the short-lived but important era of S100 bus computers. Now this cost 400 and something to get as a kit and 600 and something to get one built. And um, you know, that's a ton of money back then. And to look at it, it's like, what am I gonna do with this thing? It was really for hobbyists, but um, you know, you look at it and say, the market is kind of big, but it's nowhere near as big as the market would be for something that was a self-contained computer with obvious applications. These are diehard people who are, who are gonna try and play around with this kind of stuff. Um, but in a very short amount of time, S100 bus computers became pretty popular. Um, they all looked almost the same form factor, a big box with like 10 slots in it. It was a passive backplane, so that means there was just a power supply in the box and everything else was on a card. So if you wanted a CPU, it was on a card. If you wanted RAM, it was on a card. If you wanted a serial port, it was on a card, parallel port, uh, you name it. And these companies popped up, right? Chromemco, Vector Graphic, IMSI was the first initial uh, competitor to the Altair. And you may have heard, uh, you may have recognized that front panel from the movie War Games, because that's probably the most famous IMSI in the world uh, that people have seen. And uh, what is that up at the top? A North Star Horizon. Um, so um, time went on, people started playing around with the S100 bus. And, uh, but there's, there's issues, right? You still look at this and go, uh, with the exception of that guy, there's no screens, there's no keyboards in these pictures. Like, how the heck do you even, what, what, do, you do, what do you do with this? There's a power button, that's it. I mean, how am I supposed to use this computer? Well, you had two options. Um, you could get a hold of one of these gigantic teletypes, which uh, has the keyboard and a mechanical printing mechanism. And if you're lucky, maybe even a paper tape reader. And hook it all up to your Altair, and now you were cooking, but you already spent, you know, $600 on your Altair, and, you know, the teletype might set you back another $1,500 or something like that. You know, it, it's, uh, this hobby's getting really expensive. Um, or you could get uh, what they called originally the glass TTY, which is a uh, teletype in the form of a terminal. Um, and these things are just, you know, stuff you would connect to a serial port and let you do I.O. And this is all you needed to get going, but it was an additional cost for any S100 bus system. Um, and so in 1975, a company came along called Processor Technology. And 
among other things, they started thinking about what would happen if we could make a video card that would plug into an S100 machine. Uh, if we could do that, we could at least partially replace the need for a terminal or a teletype. Um, in addition, uh, the, the kinds of keyboards that people were using were starting to um, gel. They were starting to turn in, uh, into a standard that's called an ASCII parallel keyboard, which we don't have these anymore, but they were people were building those as kits and, and that sort of thing. So um, with, with the keyboards starting to become standardized, if we made a video card, uh, we could partially replace the need for a terminal teletype, and maybe we could even make a self-contained computer, which had the I.O. that you would need in order to, to make it useful out of the box. Um, so the guys from Processor Technology um, uh, worked with a guy named Lee Felsenstein, who created this card. Uh, it's really the world's first video card. It plugs into the S100 bus. The S100 bus has called it because it has 100 pins, 50 on each side. It's quite large. Um, he had done a design that he called the Tom Swift terminal based on the Tom Swift novels, young adult novels. Um, and he kind of gave away that design to some hobbyists. And to my knowledge, uh, uh, none were ever built up till at least the time when the, this card was designed. But uh, the guys from Processor Technology worked with Lee Felsenstein. He designed this video card. And you know, he obviously was looking around at, how can I do this? How can I do this on the cheap? How can I do this with a minimum number of chips? I mean, you can see the card is basically full. And, uh, and there's no keyboard interface or anything. It's just video. Um, but this thing worked. And furthermore, the design got expanded out into a full computer which you may have heard of before, it's called the Sol 20. Processor technology came out with this machine in 1976. Um, it is based on the 8080. If you open this up, to me this is one of the best looking computers ever. Right? It's, it's, it's really aesthetically pleasing to me. It has these walnut sides and blue. If you open it up, you'll see that there's an S100 bus inside there with cards stacked up on top of each other in the back. Um, so the bus design is S100 internally. It used the VDM1 card um, as video. It obviously has integrated keyboard and even though you don't see a cassette player here it was designed from the beginning to have cassette based storage and you would connect it up to a TV um, or a monitor uh, and, and you know this is the, sh the shape of things to come literally right? So again with my my Python code um, what I did is the VDM1, in the, Sol, the VDM1 was in the Sol 20, so the display looked the same whether you bought a VDM1 and put it in your own S100 machine or whether you actually shelled out uh, the big box for a Sol 20. Um, and this was what it looked like. Uh, it actually had what I would call really good looking descenders, these lowercase things that you can see it's, um, it's still a, a five by, what is this one? Hmm. This is a, this is a seven by nine font ROM. But the nine scan lines can move up and down within that field of 16. So you could get like, you know, a Y and a P and a Q and a J, and they all look really good in lowercase. Um, and what else can I say about this? When you bought, a, when you bought one, uh, you would either get an MCM 6574 character ROM, which gave you this font, or you would get a 6575, which gave you some different symbols. And apparently, uh, you just got what you got when you ordered one. So uh, there you go. Um, this is the kind that you'd normally see in a terminal, which has like the little abbreviations for ASCII characters. Actually, uh, one funny tidbit here is these, these weird symbols here, which are also part of the Model 1 font ROM, but they're kind of hidden away. These are apparently a standard that represents a visual representation of the ASCII control codes that they stand for. So, you know, there's a weird symbol there for the line feed character, but it's supposed to mean line feed. So I, I thought that was pretty interesting. You can think about what, what those characters are supposed to be controlling and then try to see if you can interpret them uh, that way. So in retrospect, the VDM1 Sol 20, 64 by 16 characters, again, uh, seven by nine font, which was like really fancy for, for that machine. It used 1K of video RAM. That seems like a common pattern. It has a slightly different timings 
end up with 260 scan lines instead of 264, but I mean, you know, you can't really tell from looking at it. Um, that font, if you noticed, I should go back, uh, it had reverse characters. So they use half of the font set to give you a reverse version of the other half. So reverse characters are nice, but they double the size of the characters that you're going to take up. So there wasn't room to do much else. Um, so about the only other relationship there between that and the TRS-80 is that a couple of games, at least two versions of three games, were probably ports from the SOL-20 to the TRS-80. Um, I don't know, I haven't looked at the code, um, I haven't compared them directly to know whether they share code, because one is an 8080 machine, the other one's a Z80 machine, so the 8080 code should work. The video is mapped the same way exactly. Um, I'm gonna see real quick if I can pop up one of these. These are YouTube videos. Um, let's see where it's going to go. Somebody did a nice uh, comparison here between this is, this is Invasion Force and what, Trek 80, I think, on the Sol. Uh, the other one is the fa famous Flying Saucers game that I, I know a lot of people have seen at Radio Shack. That was also based on another game called Target. But you can see that the Sol didn't have the character graphics that the TRS-80 did. But to me, it sure looks like they just went ahead and made a, you know, enhanced it. They, they took all the Star Trek branding away. They probably started to care about actual licensing and uh, used neutral space terminology for this guy. Added some TRS-80 graphics and uh, yeah, pretty similar stuff. So, um, you know, the video subsystems were similar enough that, that at least a couple games made the jump from one platform to the other. So that brings us to 1976, another company that made S100 bus machines. Now this one, I happen to actually have two of them, and uh, just a little aside, the whole reason why this talk came about is because uh, these machines ended up in the custody of myself and my friend in terms of, uh, you know, it's like here, here's these S100 bus machines, here's some cards that go with them. Uh, and there's a great story online if you want to if you want to look into it, uh, you can find my, my friend Evan's blog where he talks about um, restoring these guys. Uh, they didn't have so first of all, you notice that most of the S100 bus machines, first of all, they're heavy. Second of all, they're usually much bigger than this. This was originally branded the Micro Altair because it's so much smaller. Um, but I think they got a nasty gram from the Altair people pretty quickly, say you can't call your machine a micro Altair, that violates our trademark. So they renamed themselves Polymorphic. And, um, but they came up with this compact design S100 bus machine. There's five slots in here, as opposed to 10. Um, it has kind of an interesting S100 bus extension along the bottom. So you can actually stack two of these next to each other and, and make a bigger machine. Um, but then you have two power supplies, so you have to disable one. Um, most of them are missing these orange covers. This is a reproduction orange cover because they got really hot inside. You can imagine running the stuff with the cover on. Um, yeah, there's some warnings. I, I have a third party RAM card. You read through the manual and it talks about all these features and all things that it has. And then there's a big warning saying, if you put this in a poly 88, you know, you must have forced air cooling or it will fry. And I'm pretty sure there are many peripherals that if they thought about it, they should have that warning. Um, the fan was an option, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, you, you, definitely, you definitely want to do that. So people took the covers off and they're lost in time. We couldn't find any, even to try to match the orange paint, we matched the orange against the manuals that came with it where they had an orange branding. Um, anyway, when we built these up, they didn't have any polymorphic cards in them. They had other companies' S100 bus cards in them. And uh, I started to do a little research on these machines and said, oh, it's too bad. Polymorphic had some, some pretty neat cards. It'd be cool if we could find some. And then uh, this year at an estate sale, we found the big brother of these machines, which is a full-size machine with a floppy interface, and it had all the polymorphic cards in it. And so we snatched that up. And now, uh, well, this is the empty chassis. The one that's running at, over there has the polymorphic cards in them. Um, but 
I want to throw out the words here at the bottom of this slide, virtual front panel. So these guys had the same idea, we want to make a video card. And uh, so, and then we wouldn't use the lights and switches, we would use a virtual front panel. So here's the card they came up with. It's called the VTI card. What's cool about this is it does the video. It also has a keyboard interface. So there's a socket here, the one up at the top there, it says KBD. Um, you could plug in any ASCII keyboard to that. It came with one, but you could, as long as you had the right pinout adapted, uh, you could use your parallel ASCII keyboard. So you have all the I.O. This is like the, the dream fulfilled, right? We don't need a teletype anymore. We don't need a terminal anymore. We can just use this guy. And it's just going to take up one slot. So uh, you had the option to go with 32 or 64 by 16 characters. 32 if you're going to plug into a TV, and 64 if you're going to plug into a monitor. Uh, but it also had pixel graphics. And the pixel graphics were in a 2 by 3 array per character, 128 pixels by 48 pixels. So um, when I realized that this had this, this was the whole, I, this brought me to this entire talk. It was like, hey, that's, that's really similar to the DRS80 graphics, right? So similar but not the same. Uh, and I'll get into this in another slide. But the mapping to the characters, the pixel mapping, and the pixel sense were all very different from the TRS-80. Um, and I'll get into that. But it also still had the nice 7 by 9 font, 1K video RAM. It had the same timings as the TV typewriter. And it used a, a different version of that same family of character generator ICs. So ah, here's one more ad. Uh, this is one that were still branded as the Micro Altair. And you can see they're using the 32. Um, they're using a combination of the 32 characters across and the pixel graphics for the ad. There's some prices on here. It looks like it can all be yours for uh, 185 for the kit or 260 assembled. So that's much cheaper than the, the teletype and presumably the terminals that were available at the time. Um, here's what this guy looked like. So now, how many differences can we spot between this and the TRS-80 without looking at a TRS-80? Uh, so we've got uppercase. We've got really good looking lowercase. This is pre-model one, right? Um, we've got pixel graphics. Uh, you might notice the, the, white, the white parts of the pixel graphics, there's more white on the left side of the screen than there is on the right side of the screen. Uh, and you might also notice that this is somewhat inverted from the other pictures because the graphics come first and the characters come second. So ah, I just want to show you one more. This slide is a little bit out of order, but this is the big brother of the polymorphic system that uh, we found at the estate sale. We did not get the wooden cover with it. It was basically sitting in someone's basement uh, looking pretty shabby with no cover. But, and it had two of the three drives, but it had all the cards that we needed to, to make these guys run. Oh, by the way, that graph, I mean, you know, that could be in a Tandy ad, right? I mean, I'm trying to figure this out. He's, He's probably a lawyer because those are like law books. But then like, so what is he graphing? Is that like income or what? I don't know what that is. OK, so finally, 1977, TRS-80 Model 1. 5x7 uh, font, graphics, same as the VTI. Uh, this is a picture of the Model 1 in its original incarnation and its fonts. The pixels start off black on the left, and they become white on the right. <laughs> and you notice it's all uppercase. There's no descenders. This is the uppercase only. Um, I could probably, it's a whole nother thing to talk about all the different things that happen with upper and lowercase on a Model 1. And uh, that's not really the, the focus of this talk. But I have a couple more slides. This is what happens if you do a lowercase mod on an early Model 1. You get these uh, 5 by 7 fonts that have these funky non-descending descenders and then the infamous flying A, which is too high. Um, there's all kinds of speculation about why this is there. Uh, one of them being that uh, Radio Shack thought that no one's going to see these characters because we're selling this as an uppercase only thing. So even though these lowercase characters are in the ROM, no one's ever going to see them. So you know maybe we got a deal from Motorola on these chips because uh, these A's are in the wrong place. Um, you could make your own chips, by the way, in the, back in the day. You could order a standard part with a standard font. or you could get out a deck of uh, punch cards and uh, 
basically design each character uh, and then send your stack of punch cards into the company and then order like a bunch of mask ROMs for a bunch of money and get like a custom one. So Radio Shack was actually, uh, you know, were these custom ones, were these ones that were laying around on the floor that like, you know, the, the Radio Shack used in the first machines? They were probably custom. Um, but again, they weren't used for, they weren't meant to show their lower case. I don't have, I guess there was a ROM revision that is the same as this, but lowered the A. I don't actually have a dump of that ROM. If somebody does, I'd love to have it just because I'm being a completist. Um, but I'm gonna jump right from this to what happened when Radio Shack realized we really need lowercase. Um, if you look carefully, I'll do that again. Oops. Bah, wrong way. You can see that all the characters went up by one scan line. So they realized that they could use the top scan line because they really have eight, even though they were only using seven. So they scooted them all up by one. And then now they had sort of two free ones at the bottom and they managed to squeeze in descenders that are cute and fit into, the, fit into that extra two scan lines. So now, I don't know, the, the, this uh, captures this classic TRS-80 look now. I noticed the apostrophes on names are a British pound sign as well. How did that affect the display? <sighs> that's, a, that's a good question. Um, Yeah, the, qu the question was, uh, the, the, the pound sign replaced what, an apostrophe, was it? Uh, or the some inverted apostrophe. The inverted apostrophe, yeah. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I never, I, I really was a Model 3 person for the bulk of my programming time, so maybe somebody else who had one or both of these lowercase mods would know the difference. But, uh, yeah, that's just, you know, if you put that character, if you, if you ask for that character, you're going to get something different with one ROM than the other. Um, Okay, so uh, real quick, so what happened here? First of all, the graphics and the text were swapped between the VTI and the TRS-80. So uh, they decided, so ASCII is a seven bit encoding. So there's a standard for the numbers zero through 127 for ASCII. And then later when you realize that you're putting everything into a byte, you kind of get everything from 128 to 255. Um, and so most computers decided to use ASCII in the range where it was ASCII as best as possible and then stick your special stuff up above that. Um, for whatever reason, in the VTI, they did the exact opposite. They put the graphics in the low side and they put the text in the high side. And so uh, it wasn't as bad as you might think because they had an API that said print a character and you could pass regular ASCII into the print a character API and then they would do the translation in there. Uh, in their ROM code, and uh, it would write the right thing into memory. But if you're trying to write a game, and you're just writing, forget, forget that, I want to write directly to memory, then you have to do all this bookkeeping. Um, so the TRS-80 fixed that. They put the characters back where they're supposed to go. They make it ASCII compatible, and they put the graphics up above. But even more so, um, the pixels were really scrambled, because if you try to write to the VTI and do graphics, the various bits would go in and represent different pixels. So this shows you that like bit zero is the bottom right corner, bit one is the bottom is the right middle, etc. Um, so that's one pixel mapping. And the pixel sense is if you write a zero bit, that means turn the pixel on. And if you write a one bit, it means turn the pixel off. So uh, the TRS-80, now I'm, I'm assuming this was, this was deliberate, whether it was to uh, make sure you weren't the same as the VTI or whether it was to just make sense out of the stuff. In a way, it was uh, probably good that the VTI had things so uh, scrambled from the, what ended up in the TRS-80 because, uh, you know, a lot of things were different. It was not a copy, right? Um, the pixel mappings here go as X coordinates first and then Y coordinates, Y coordinates going down for uh, computer graphics, right? And the pixel sense was swapped to like one being on and zero being off. So all those changes got made. Um, character set was reorganized. It's ASCII compatible. Um, graphics go where it makes sense. The pixel sizes had to be adapted a little because of the difference in the scan lines between the VTI and the Model 1. Um, but the coordinates were made compatible with the XY and the sense was corrected, it, I want to say corrected, but it was set to a way that was sensible for an API. 
And the most important thing, I think, is that, you know, this guy had an, uh, its own basic in ROM based on Palo Alto Tiny Basic, the same as a Model 1. But they did not have support in the basic for these pixel graphics. Radio Shack was smart in that they added the set and reset commands to basic so that anybody could s do the pixel graphics easily from basic and actually easier from assembly uh, than you would have to from on the VTI. So um, I look at this and I see sort of like, okay, the TV typewriter gives you a good example of how to do things. The Sol 20 kind of goes down uh, another level and they don't bother to do graphics but they're still heavily influenced by what happened with the TV typewriter and then the VTI comes out and they go ahead and let's try to do this pixel graphics thing but they they make some serious implementation uh, challenges uh, into a problem and then the model one comes along and you know uses that same philosophy but but fixes all the warts so I went on Ira's site and I happened to find this interview with Steve Leininger, the designer of the Model 1, that he said in 1977, and uh, he actually addresses this. I was, I was stunned. I was searching for like polymorphic Model 1, whatever. I found this quote, which says, we did add graphics to our video. Our graphics are very similar to polymorphics. It was not intentional. We didn't blatantly copy polymorphic graphics. It's just that it's an inexpensive graphics to come up with. And, uh, and you know, I, I think he's 100% Right, you know, if you look in the TV typewriter cookbook all the way back there, there were designs for how you could do pixel graphics on a, on a variation of a TV typewriter. You know, there's only so many ways that you can do some of these things. But, um, but I think, you know, Steve Leininger probably, and it's all speculation on my part, but he probably saw the potential of the graphics and also the making those graphics available from basic and from assembly easily and uh, it, it you know, influenced the TRS-80's design. So you can read this whole interview. There's some interesting stuff in there. That I think uh, he's answering some questions from an audience in 1977. One of the questions he gets in addition is, uh, is there going to be an S100 bus interface for the TRS-80 Model 1? Because that's still on everybody's mind in 1977, you know? Um, and uh, he talks about how it wouldn't be that hard to make one, but he doesn't think Radio Shack's going to do it, and that some entrepreneur should, should jump in there and do it. Um, so, interesting reading, uh, snapshot in time. So, uh, yeah, I kind of went through this already, I jumped ahead, but uh, TV Typewriter 1, Sol 20 VDM, uh, you know, the simple mapping to 1K was what made it easy, made it easy to port some of their games. Uh, and then you got graphics that weren't that easy to use. And then, you know, among all the other reasons why the Model 1 was a success, right? Uh, it had all of these features. They were even more accessible in this package for a low price with retail support, all, all the other reasons in addition. But I think uh, this is the reason why graphics were so easy and so accessible on the Model 1. Um, yeah. So I have a picture of a TRS-80 graphics book. I have the book back there. This was a book I had when I was younger. Maybe some of you had it too. Um, talked about how to draw lines and you know, you could buy the, the big pad of paper that had 120 by 48, and uh, I'm sure, you know, people dreaming of writing their own video games, coloring in squares with a pencil. Uh, so that is the extent of my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Please stop by, oh, I'm sorry, I want to say one more thing before I take questions. At the uh, exhibit over there, uh, what I did to sort of show the similarities in machine architecture is I have an emulator of a SOL 20, I have the polymorphic machine, and I have a Model 1. And what I did is I found an open source program, uh, a Tetris program that uh, uh, a gentleman wrote in, uh, and uh, it uses the Z80, uh, Z88DK compiler, which is a compiler that targets 8080 and Z80 machines. And so I dressed it up with some extra TRS-80 graphics and I ported the same program to run on all three architectures. So you can go over there and play Tetris, and you can also see how the experience on the VTI is basically the same as the experience on the TRS-80, which is, which is pretty interesting. Um, let's, go ahead. So when we talked to Steve Leininger on the Trash Talk podcast, he specifically singled out Don Lancaster's work as inspiration for the work he did. He used the term standing on the shoulders of giants. Oh, wow. So it really did 
if you want to understand why he did what he did with the TRS-80, read John Lancaster. Oh, great. So that's, uh, let me just repeat that in case the mic didn't pick it up. Uh, Deet said that uh, when they talked to Steve Leininger on the Tierra City uh, po podcast, Trash Talk podcast, uh, he talked about Don Lancaster specifically and called him out and used the phrase uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. So it seems like at least some of what I said isn't just speculation. That's great. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm pretty sure that book influenced all of the design. Yeah. Probably even Lee Feldenstein because it predates it, and um, there's only so many ways to solve it, and it was so clearly explained. Like, right. Like Don. Um, I don't know. What is that? What do you think? Yeah. No, I think so. I mean, I'm sure Don's books were scattered on the workbenches of all these people. Everybody in the Homebrew Computer Club probably had them. Um, I know that. You know, there's an alternate. There's an alternate timeline here where you look at what happened with Apple and Commodore and how they ended up with 40 columns and uh, you know but it still comes back to the TV typewriter and Don Lancaster because uh, um, you know it like you said there's only there's only so many ways to do it and Don Lancaster really showed a lot of people how to do it so <laughs> anything else nope go ahead Right, so the question was, how did the VTI do the block graphics? And uh, the answer is, it, it did it the same way the Model 1 did with like circuitry to generate it as opposed to just having a bigger ROM and putting those patterns in there. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much.